So, uh, so the point of last lecture was to introduce you to the to the three uh, most physically important classes of metrics: the maximally symmetric space times, um, the Friedman Robertson Walker space times, which will actually be the cosmological space times of interest to us, uh, and the black hole space times. And so uh, last lecture was taken up with giving a simple uh, uh, sort of unified uh, uh, derivation of all of the maximally symmetric space times as, as simple embeddings, quadratic embeddings in some higher dimensional flat space. Um, and then showing, so just showing the relationship between all of those and, 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 and the FRW metrics, which we saw were made use of the, or are precisely the metrics that can be sliced into one time direction and three spatial directions, such that the three spatial directions always have, uh, as their three-dimensional metric, one of these maximally symmetric uh, spaces, either the, either the k equals plus one three sphere or the k equals zero three-dimensional Euclidean space or the k equals minus one uh, three-dimensional hyperboloid. Uh, I didn't get a chance to say anything about black holes. Uh, and because I'm supposed to be focusing on cosmology, I won't say too much about them here. Uh, if you want an introduction to the two most important black hole spacetimes, uh, I encourage you to look at the notes if you haven't uh, if you haven't met them before. In particular, there's you know the most famous and one of the first metrics found, one of the first solutions found of Einstein's equations, is the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, and that describes uh, a non-spinning black hole, a black hole that's just sitting there but is spherically symmetric, not spinning at all. Um, and then there is the spinning generalization of that. A black, in general, black holes will spin. Uh, and that's the so-called Kerr metric. Um, so this guy, to a very good approximation, not only describes non-spinning black holes, but it also describes the space-time outside any, any sort of collapsed object that's not a black hole, like, uh, like uh, the Earth or the Sun, any isolated collapsed, collapsed body. Uh, the metric outside of the body is very well approximated by the Schwarzschild metric. Um, it's really only once once a thing collapses down uh, to near to, to near its Schwarzschild radius that the effects of its spin become a very important perturbation on the space time outside the, the, the body. So so once you get down to once you get once you've actually collapsed down to a black hole, like so the Earth is spinning, and so in principle, uh, general relativity predicts that there is some effect due to that, that if you're an astronaut floating out in space, uh, uh, the fact that the Earth is spinning will, will by itself, according to general relativity, will, will, will for example, cause you to uh, drag slowly around in orbit around the Earth in the same direction that the Earth is spinning. Uh, but, you know, for the Earth, that's a very tiny effect, very, very difficult to measure. Uh, but for, for real astrophysical black holes, uh, you know, they're, they're surrounded by accretion disks that are dumping matter onto them, uh, you know, the real black holes in the real physical universe. And, and it's it appears to be typical that they have very high spins and that their spin is having a very, can have very dramatic effects on the, you know, in, in the parts of the accretion disk that are closest to the black hole. Um, so I just wanted to say that a couple more things about, you know, what is the relationship between the symmetries of these guys? You know, basically, we said the maximally symmetric space times, you can think of, you can think of Minkowski space. In Minkowski space, you know what the symmetries are. There's, there's 10 of them. Uh, uh, there, there's the fact that you can go, you can translate yourself by any amount. You can translate your laboratory to any point in the space time. You can translate in the time direction or any of the three spatial directions. and no observation you do will be able to uh, tell you that wh whether your laboratory was over here or over here. So that's four translations. Alternatively, you can rotate your laboratory. So instead of pointing your apparatuses this way, you can rotate them in this way. Won't be able to tell the difference. So that's three rotations. And then you can also, you know, boost your laboratory, move at some speed v through the space time. And again, the the, the symmetry of the space time will forbid you from being able to 
determine whether you're in some sense at rest or moving with respect to Minkowski space. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's 10 symmetries and all of the maximally symmetric metrics, the de Sitter metric and the anti de Sitter metric uh, have also 10 symmetries. And uh, in fact, I think maybe that, that will be explored in the Friday tutorial. Uh, so maybe I won't say more about that. Uh, the Friedman, Robertson, Walker metrics we said have less symmetry. They have only six symmetries because the idea is if this is the time direction, Again, we, we, the FRW metrics are exactly the ones that may be sliced up uh, in the spatial direction, such that, so there's no particular symmetry in this direction. So instead of, uh, so we used to have four translations, an arbitrary translation in time and three in space. Now the time translation is no longer a symmetry, but we can still move our lab to any point on a spatial slice uh, and, and its equivalent. Um, so we have three translations. And then furthermore, if we take our laboratory here and we uh, uh, you know, if we, if we rotate within our spatial slice and point our telescope or our apparatus in a different direction, uh, we'll make the same observations in such a space time. So we have three, three, rot three rotations also for six symmetries. Uh, you know, but there's no there's no boost symmetries either. So the three boosts are also gone. There's a preferred spatial slicing in cosmology. There's a cosmic rest frame. That's just an observed fact, and you can tell if you're moving with respect to it. And we'll be discussing later how you can uh, how you can tell, um, and also why we are so close to approximately at rest uh, with respect to it. Uh, so Schwarzschild, you know, Schwarzschild, if you compare it to the maximally symmetric slices. Uh, the story is different. Uh, now there's a preferred spatial point, the origin of the black hole, so, so the, the, the center of the black hole. So there's, there's, you're no longer free to translate uh, spatially, so, but you're still free to translate in time. This, the space time is just static. So there's still a time translation. So this, this two gets, this four gets reduced to one, just time translations. That's the only translational symmetry. And then there's, there's full, Rotational symmetry, if you, uh, uh, the, the black hole is spherically symmetric, so you can rotate it any way you want, and you can't tell that you've rotated it. So there's, there's one translation plus three rotational symmetries. And then Kerr is uh, a little bit less symmetric than that. It still has time translational symmetry, but now it's spinning. It has a, some preferred axis picked out by the, the axis around which the space time is spinning. Um, and around which you will be dragged if you're just a, a, a observer sitting outside the hovering outside the black hole. Um, and uh, so yeah, so it, it it now has symmetry under rotations about that one axis, but any of the other two rotations which would change that axis are no longer symmetries of the space. So there's just one plus one time time translations plus axial symmetry. Uh, and the only thing I wanted to say. Uh, a qualitative remark is that normally, somehow in physics and math, the things with the highest symmetry are the most beautiful. But there's no question, Kerr is like the most awesome metric that's ever, the most awesome solution of Einstein's equations that's ever been found. It's, 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 it's absolutely, has far more beautiful properties than it has any right to, given its measly number of symmetries. And, uh, uh, and it, it happens to be the case that, uh, 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 you know, if you, it's believed to be the case, not proven to be the case, but believed to be the case that in an arbitrary generic gravitational collapse, you take any pile of junk you want and make it unstable to collapse, and, and then it collapses to form a black hole, and initially it's a big mess, but then it very rapidly settles down to exactly this metric. And so this is what people say when they, they mean a black hole has no hair. They mean, they mean that it set, settles down to uh, at the end of the day, whatever complicated system you started with, it settles down to uh, a, a perfect a, 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 a solution exterior to the black hole that uh, is just perfectly described by this simple metric that only has these two free parameters, the mass and the spin. Um, and uh, yeah, so, 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 so somehow it's a bit of a miracle that even though Einstein's equations are these Nonlinear partial differential equations, which normally you, you you don't really have much of a hope of solving. Uh, you don't you know you, normally you can't find any solutions to a nonlinear partial differential equation, but in fact we you know fortunately uh, 
for the Einstein equations, there, there do appear to be solutions uh, uh, for that, that well approximate nearly all of the physical uh, systems of, of interest in the universe. Um, and, uh, and in particular, even in the case of lowest symmetry, there is this uh, that we, we, we can sort of write down the general solution that, 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 that describes the end state of the collapse. Uh, and it's just cr crazy beautiful. So, so in, in regard to that, I just want to make one more remark, which is that normally when you're introduced to the Kerr metric, there's kind of two standard coordinate systems. Normally when you're introduced to the Kerr metric, you're introduced to it in so-called Boyer-Lindquist coordinates. These are the ones that are commonly used for astrophysical calculations, because th these are the ones that when you take the limit that the spin goes to zero, they reduce to these Schwarzschild coordinates. So it's, it's, it's clear that in some sense they're just a perturbation or, or a deformation of the Schwarzschild metric. Um, but then there, there, there are these other coordinates, the Kerr shield coordinates, uh, uh, which are the ones that Kerr originally discovered uh, when he was like 24. So, you know, get, you know, be, you know clock is ticking, guys. Uh, um, uh, so... In these coordinates, the, the 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 beauty of the of the metric is much more manifest. And in fact, in these coordinates, these are, these are sort of quasi Cartesian coordinates, like the ones like exactly like the quasi quasi Cartesian coordinates that we used to derive the maximally symmetric metrics. And in fact, in those coordinates, the, this this bears a kind of striking resemblance to the maximally symmetric uh, metrics. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. I'm just trying to get you excited about the Kerr metric. Uh, I should also mention. David is like one of the world's experts on the Kerr metric and its beautiful properties. So if you want to know more about it, uh, ask him. Okay. So, but now our job for the next two lectures is to uh, get to know the Friedman Robertson Walker uh, metrics well enough that we have sort of a good physical picture of what they are. Uh, not, not, not something, what we, what we have at the moment is a bit formal. Um, so we want to know what particles do as they, as they propagate through that space-time. Uh, and we want to know how the space-time interacts with matter that's in it. How, do, how does the matter change the evolution of the space-time? Uh, and how does the evolution of the space-time uh, affect the matter? Um, and so the idea is hopefully to culminate by the end of Friday's lecture with, no lecture tomorrow I remind you, but hopefully to culminate by the end of Friday's lecture with a reason, with, with, with a description of the lambda CDM model, the sort of current standard picture of the universe, where so so you know, so we can at least have a physical picture of, of, of roughly speaking what the model is that describes uh, that appears to describe uh, the observations today, and then we can next week get into the question of, you know, what's puzzling about that model, what what what, yeah, what, what are the puzzles? Okay, so so. So let's look at FRW now. So what we said last time, we derived these maximally symmetric metrics. We said they're, we derived the maximally symmetric metric with signature P comma Q. In other words, P space directions and Q time directions and curvature K, which could be plus, plus or minus one or zero. Um, and then we said that in particular, our four dimensional Cos cosmological space-time, the universe on large scales, appears to be described by uh, a metric that is a maximally symmetric space-time with three space and no time directions. Uh, and then, and then, and then, and then we add time by just by just saying, well, there, there's there's a there, we add a time coordinate, and then this scale factor is just as, as the scale factor, uh, you know, if this is the scale factor as a function of time, uh, you know, if it goes like this, that's saying that that this this spatial surface, let's say it's a three sphere, as as time evolves, it's 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 it, it's growing and I know it undergoes a little bump and then it then it grows more, for example. So A of T just, just represents how the spatial surface stretches uh, or shrinks as a function of time. 
Okay, so more explicitly, in the, in the coordinates we used last time, those quasi-Cartesian coordinates, this metric looks like, you know, what we found was that this metric is, there's the Kronecker delta, and then Um, okay, and now, so the first thing I, I want to say is that, th so th this is, this metric is correct, but these are not the coordinates that you'll usually see in a cosmology textbook. Um, there, there are two other, well, so there, there are a couple of other standard coordinate systems, and so we just want to uh, introduce those right now. <coughs> First of all, what, what is usually done is you change to spherical coordinates. So if we just take those spatial coordinates, x1 and x2 and x3, and change to ordinary spherical coordinates, so x1 is equal to r sine theta cosine phi, r sine theta sine phi, and r cosine theta, then if you just take those expressions and, and, and the corresponding expressions for dx1 and dx2 and dx3, uh, plug them in there, simplify a little bit, you'll find that the metric becomes, you know what, before I say that I wanted to make one remark. So last time we just, we, we, when we found the metric of maximal symmetry, it always depended on this parameter rho, which had d units of length and uh, which represented the radius of radius of curvature. So, so in the spherical case, that rho was the radius of the sphere. Now, the one thing I wanted to say was, you know, if you notice that now now that we have both rho and a in the game, we can all, we're always free to rescale, redefine the coordinates. Uh, and the scale factor in such a way as to set rho to one. So in other words, suppose you, suppose you took your x coordinates and you define new coordinates x twiddle by pulling out a factor of rho. And then you also defined a new scale factor uh, a twiddle by pulling out a factor of one over rho. Um, so suppose you suppose you plug that in here. So so if you plug in x is equal to rho x twiddle, this becomes k rho squared x twiddle. Then we also get rho squared x twiddle x twiddle up here. So the rho squareds cancel here. Here we these become dx twiddle dx twiddle times rho squared. And then this guy becomes a twiddle squared times one over rho squared. So that rho squared cancels that rho squared. And so the new metric just looks exactly the same as the old metric except a, is a has become a twiddle, x has become x twiddle, and rho has become one. Okay, uh, so we're always free to do that, and conventionally that's, that's, that's always done. So from now on, I'll just assume that we've rescaled the spatial coordinates and the scale factor so that, so that, uh, so that the radius of curvature of the spatial slice uh, is one. It's just a constant one for all times, and, and any expansion or uh, any any expansion or contraction of the universe, we don't think of as expanding or contracting rho. We think of it as just a, an overall factor that expands or, 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 or that that, uh, that 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 multiplies the the intrinsic spatial metric of radius one. Um, okay. So yeah. So uh, so. Having said that, what I was going to say is now if you take that metric with rho is equal to one and you make this change of coordinates, then you get, you know, you just change the spatial coordinates to ordinary spherical coordinates, you get this, uh, you get the first standard form. Um, Okay, uh, 
where d omega squared is, is, is going to be my shorthand for the, the metric on the unit two sphere. So in other words, those are just the, these are the, this is the angular part of the metric, it looks like. Um, okay, so so that's 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 one uh, sort of radial coordinate, but there is another uh, conventional radial coordinate which is also more useful for for certain purposes, and so to get there we we define so the new radial coordinate uh, chi is is related to r as follows we we define r to be function s sub k of chi, where, where, where s sub k of chi is defined to be just sine of chi when k is equal to plus 1, uh, chi when k is equal to 0, and sinh of chi when k is equal to minus 1. So if you just again, if you just if you just replace r and dr by by the by this expression and, and the differential of this expression in this metric. It's, uh, I won't go through the algebra on the board, but uh, it's straightforward to check and you can check it. Uh, it's all in the notes if you want. Um, so, you know, basically the idea here is that, is that when the space is curved, there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be some funny business in the, uh, spatial part of the metric. And in the R coordinates, uh, uh, this part looks just like it would in, in ordinary Minkowski space. This is just how the this is just how the d theta and d phi terms would look if you rewrote the Minkowski metric in uh, polar coordinates. But this part this part is not. In Minkowski space this would just be dr squared, but now we have this funny factor of one minus uh, K over K, K R squared. On the other hand, when we when we uh, switch to the chi coordinates, this first term simplifies. It just becomes d chi squared. So now it looks just like it would in Minkowski, like the radial term in the Minkowski metric. Uh, but this term uh, becomes more complicated. It becomes this function s k squared, s k of chi squared times d omega squared. Um, okay, so that's so those are the two conventional radial coordinates uh, that that one uses in cosmology, and so let's just draw a picture of what's going on there. So here, 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 I'm drawing a picture of the easiest case to draw is the case where k is equal to plus one, and so the spatial slice is a three sphere, and so uh, now because I because I can't I can only draw a two sphere on the board. You'll have to just imagine this is a three sphere, but so the idea is that the I've drawn only two of them, but there are three that there, there there are three spatial directions x one, x two, x three, which are in this plane, and then this is the fourth direction x four in the embedding. So here I'm drawing the three sphere back in its four dimensional embedding space, and and the vertical direction here is the is the is the fourth coordinate that I'm going to eliminate. Uh, 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 to get to get a purely three dimensional metric, and so r r is just the distance from the origin. So so suppose this is the origin of coordinates up here, okay? The origin of spatial coordinates. So this is r is equal to chi is equal to zero up here. Um, and now you you want to measure the distance. The, you want you want to say what is the coordinate, the the, the radial distance of of some of some some circle out here, uh, a constant distance away from the origin. Um, well, the r coordinate is just it's the it's the normal flat distance measured using the x one, x two, x three coordinates. It's the normal radial distance on that three on, on the three dimensional Euclidean space uh, perpendicular to here. So, in other words, it's it's this. It's the distance from the it's the straight distance from the axis to the point in question. So that's what the coordinate r means geometrically. And then chi, we've just switched to, 
pi is this angle here. So you see that. So, so you can see here that if, if this is a we've 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 normalized the coordinates, so this is a unit sphere, and so indeed, if if, if chi is the angular distance between between this point and this point as measured from the center of the sphere, then R, you know, there's this triangle uh, where this side has has length one, and so R is indeed just sine chi. Um, okay, so that's intuitively. Uh, R and chi are just two different natural geometric ways to uh, to measure the distance between these two points. R is sort of the natural one with respect to the embedding space. Chi is the natural one, if you want, when you're restricted to the three-dimensional uh, space itself. Okay. So now, unfortunately, that is not all. There is one other choice, which is that. So t is one conventional coordinate, but another common thing to do is to, is to pull out uh, a of t so that instead of just multiplying the spatial part of the metric, it multiplies the whole metric. Okay, and so we can do that by by defining t is equal to a d eta. Okay, so if we change to a new cor sorry d t is equal to a d eta, or in other words, if we integrate that. Uh, that says that that eta minus some arbitrary value of eta is equal to the integral from some arbitrary value of t to t of dt prime over a of t prime. So if we do that, we we take we we, we just we just rewrite either of these expressions, but with but now, now, now the a is in front of everything. Uh, so in other words, this dot 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 means everything in here. So in other words, it, this, this metric becomes uh, this one, where, where you just take this stuff, put it in there. And this metric becomes this one, where you take this stuff and put it in there. OK, and so those are the, those are the four conventional choices for, for, uh, for coordinates on, on, uh, on FRW spacetime. Uh, the, 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 yeah, it just it just happens that that the, the different coordinates are useful for doing different things. Um, but you know, it's really ultimately rather simple. It's just there's there's two different natural radial coordinates. That's that's one possibility. There's two natural time coordinates. This one is usually called t is called physical time or co-moving time or cosmological time, and eta is called conformal time because in that language, not nothing in here depends on eta. The, 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 this metric is uh, all of the coefficients uh, in the metric are, depend purely on the spatial coordinates, uh, and the entire time dependence is is, is an overall so-called conformal factor multiplying the metric. Um, uh, in particular, uh, uh, an observed fact about the universe is that, as far as we can tell, uh, it. Uh, we live in a universe with k equals zero. The the simple case where um, uh, the simple case where this is really just nothing but where 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 we're here. So in that case, when k is zero, this is just dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. That's just the spatial part of the Minkowski metric. That's just the three dimensional Euclidean metric, but written in polar coordinates. Uh, and uh, and here, and in terms of conformal time, if we set k equal to zero, it's we just have minus d eta squared plus the three-dimensional Euclidean metric dx one squared plus dx two squared plus dx three squared. So that, that's really just static Minkowski space. And so in, in that case, life is rather simple. It's, it really is just saying every three-dimensional slice is, is three-dimensional Euclidean space, and in this language, that's just being stretched as a function of time. 
Uh, and in this language, the, the, the universe is really just uh, Minkowski space, but, but, is, but, but, but is being stretched as a function of time. Um, uh, okay, and uh, so now, um, you know, let me draw a new sphere. Whoops. Sorry, wrong button. Is it time for a joke? It probably is. So, um, so I, I'm back at uh, my wife's grandmother, Grandma Frida's house, and uh, she says, "Ah, something, something, something." And uh, my wife says she, she has a piece of advice for you. She says it's better to have a hundred friends than a hundred dollars. Uh, because you can always ask every friend for two dollars. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a related one. Well, anyway, I got to save my stuff. I got to save. There's only so much. So many. Have I got a finite amount of material? Um, okay, so. You know, in practice, I, I always kind of like to draw, even though, even though, as I just said, um, uh, so our actual universe is, is, is the three-dimensional slices are infinite Euclidean space. Uh, and the problem with that is it's just kind of hard to, uh, somehow it's just not as evocative to draw it on the board. So I, I end up drawing the, the closed three-sphere three, three sphere anyway. Now, we, as we'll see, we, we, we could very well live in a universe that actually is, if we could observe the whole of it, uh, a three-sphere. And then the fact that, the fact that as far as we can tell, uh, it, it is flat Euclidean space. It's consistent with the k equals zero universe. It's just saying that the region of the universe that we can actually observe is some relatively small uh, uh, region around, around our position, a region so small that it's very well approximated by flat space. Uh, you know, just, yeah, just, just, like, just like on Earth, you, you know, if you explore a small enough amount of the Earth, it, it, uh, you can describe it just as a just as flat space. Um, okay, so you know, so now the picture is what you should imagine. The picture you should have in mind is that those coordinates x, the spatial coordinates there, they're so-called co-moving coordinates. So you should imagine those co-moving coordinates. So the the coordinates r and theta, all, all the spatial coordinates we've we've, we've we've discussed, whether whether they be the x's or the r or chi or uh, Theta or phi. Um, you should think of the, them all as, as as dots drawn with a marker on some balloon on this sphere, which is some balloon. And then the expansion of the universe is just you know someone is someone is blowing up the balloon. So as as so so as a uh, of t increases by a factor of two, that's saying that the radius of this balloon has been increased by a factor of two. And so uh, when that happens, the distance, the physical distance. You know the actual distance between between two co-moving coordinates, two dots that I've drawn on the balloon, will correspondingly increase by a factor of two. Uh, and so, in particular, you can see that. Uh, so as the universe, so the universe is expanding, uh, and in this picture, if you think of if, if you think of each of these dots as being a galaxy that we can observe with a telescope, uh, because the universe is expanding. Then, then we, who see photons that travel along the surface of the balloon, we see those dots moving away from us. It's like they're all receding. And furthermore, a dot that is, if we compare, you know, this, this galaxy, if, so this is us here. This is you. Okay, and you're pointing your telescope. This is your telescope. This is a horrible picture. This is a waste of a picture. Okay, so that's you. That's your little telescope. You're, you're, you're looking out in this direction. 
and you compare a nearby galaxy with another galaxy that's twice as far away. Um, so now, so let's say this guy is one unit away, one megaparsec away, and this guy is two megaparsecs away. Uh, and then the universe uh, increases by, let's say it grows by 1%, okay, in some fixed time. So this, so this guy, the, the distance here increases to 1.01 .01 megaparsecs, whereas this guy increases to 2.02 .02 megaparsecs. So in other words, in the same amount of time, the galaxy that is twice as far away from you has managed to move twice as far. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, its distance has also grown by twice as much as the, as the nearer galaxy. So this guy appears to be receding from you at twice the speed as this guy. Okay, and so this is known as Hubble's law. This was the way that the expansion of the universe was discovered in the 1920s was Hubble pointed his telescope at, at galaxies and measured uh, uh, in a way that we'll describe in a moment how fast they were receding. And he found this law that, that galaxies that were n times further away were receding n times as fast. Yeah. How do you know how far away they were? Yeah, so that is a, that is a uh, in general, that is an extremely... Well, there's how he did. So, so, so he, he, there are these stars called Cepheid variables, where if you measure, they, they, they pulsate, and if you measure how fast they pulsate, the physics is understood. So that, and they're calibrated locally, so that, so that, uh, so that uh, if you if you measure their pulsations, you can determine how intrinsically bright they are. And then, if you know how intrinsically bright they are, and then you know how, in other words, how luminous they are, and you also know how bright they appear to you, you can tell how far away they are. Um, so, so that only works for rather nearby things, though. And so the, the question of exactly how you measure how far away something is, what its physical distance is, uh, it's a very tricky thing to do in cosmology. It's, it's, it's been a thing where the error bars have always been large, and, and even in modern times haven't gotten very much smaller. He could do it with relatively nearby things using these Cepheid, Cepheid variables in the 20s. Um, uh, yeah. And you know, so so, and also he got the answer wrong by a factor of ten. Uh, you know, he got the he got he he was he was he calibrating the distance because he couldn't calibrate the distances. So he, you can get you can get he can measure quite well how fast they're moving away because he sees the spectra. He sees their atomic spectra redshifted, Doppler shifted, as if they were moving away at some velocity, and that he can measure quite accurately, but. It, it is indeed. It's been always a very fraught subject how to how to how to estimate the distances, and so yeah. In fact, he got the whole thing wrong by a factor of ten. But uh, uh, but anyway, nevertheless, he, nevertheless, the the, the 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 trend that he observed uh, turned out to be real. And uh, 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 yeah. So 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 so. Anyway, that's a very long. It's a very long and interesting story. Why don't if you're actually interested in it, it's a very long and interesting story about how you actually calibrate distances to measure the Hubble constant today. Um, but uh, let me postpone that until until after class. Um, okay, so that's so the, anyway that that that's Hubble's law. That was, he he that that observation was the first. You know, really. So Einstein found general relativity in the 1915, and then people got you know a small group of people got to work finding solutions of it. And found that there were solutions in which the universe was expanding and contracting, and uh, you know Einstein dismissed those solutions as unphysical. Uh, uh, and then, and then the, you know the, historically the story was that then Hubble came along and found that actually the universe did appear to be expanding, and so uh, Einstein and others had to revise the uh, had to revise their theoretical picture. Um, so the other thing to say is that uh, again, so if this if if you instead of pointing your telescope this way, and measuring how fast things are receding as a function of distance in this direction, you do it. In, you do it. You know, in this direction along the sphere, uh, you'll get exactly the same answer. So, in other words, that's that's a manifestation of the isotropy of the universe. The fact that it's the universe is rotationally invariant. So, if you if you make your if you measure Hubble's law in this direction, you'll find the same curve as if you measure curve of distance versus speed as if you measure it in this direction. So again, that's called that's lingo as you call that isotropy of the universe. It's a measured fact about the universe. And then uh, the other thing, which uh, uh, which this model says, is that 
you know, you, intuitively you might think that if, if, if you're surrounded by a, a bunch of galaxies and they're all expanding away from you, it sounds a lot like you're at the center of the universe and there was some explosion and you're, you happen to be right at the center. Uh, but you can see in this picture that that's not, that's not the case. You know, if you were sitting over here on this galaxy and looking out at, at uh, nearby galaxies and then galaxies twice as far away, you know, you'd see exactly the same expansion law over here as, as, this, as this guy measures over here. And, and again, that, so that's the basically spatial translational invariance or homogeneity uh, of the FRW universe. Um, let me see, did I want to say anything else about that? Um, yeah, okay, that's it. So, so uh, I next wanted to go on to talk about uh, uh, geodesics. So uh, now, if you if you if you if you fire a particle, if a part if a particle uh, is moving through the space time, you know what are its basic properties? So there's a simple there's a sim single simple rule you should remember, and that we'll derive right now uh, uh, that characterizes the whole story. So, so basically what we want to say, what we want to derive is that the, the physical momentum of a particle uh, drops as 1 over A, quote unquote redshifts as 1 over A, uh, proportional to 1 over A, the spatial momentum does, uh, in an expanding universe. And then we want to we derive that and we want to see what is the what does that really mean for relativistic particles on the one hand and for non-relativistic particles on the other? Okay, surprisingly large, large number of the observed features of the universe are accounted for uh, by that, that simple rule. So that, that's, 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 that's kind of one thing worth remembering. So let's, de let's derive that. So remember... Remember that last time I said, if you, uh, you know, there's 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 two ways to derive the geodesic equation. There's 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 a way that you there's there's there's, there's a notion of of, of geodesic. Um, so, you have, so let's imagine you have some curve, x of t, or x of uh, x mu of lambda through your space time, uh, and so that the, the uh, the momentum of this particle is p mu is equal to dx mu d lambda. So uh, lambda is a so, lambda is is a so-called affine parameter along the curve. In the ma in the massive case, it's 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 more conventional to write uh, uh, to, to to define lambda is to, to define the proper time to be m, the mass of the particle, times lambda. Uh, so this is, so, so, so normally, normally you think of the, the curve as being x mu of tau, the, the proper time of the particle. But that, uh, that definition fails in, in, uh, you know, in, in the case where m goes to zero. The, the, proper time does, the proper time doesn't advance for a massless particle. Um, and uh, so, since we want to treat massive particles and massless particles together in the following derivation, I'll just switch over to this uh, affine parameter lambda, which is finite for both types of particles. Okay, and uh, and now we could one way to calculate the geodesic equation would be to calculate uh, u mu, in other words, d so really. So u mu is proportional to p mu, but so the, the the tangent vector to the curve, its its derivative, its directional derivative along the curve, set that equal to zero. Um, but there there's an easier way to do it, which is that we take the metric. Uh, so so we said the metric is, for example, we could write it this way, dt squared plus a squared of t. Uh, gij three zero k dxi dxj. 
or this guy doesn't, this guy does not depend on time, it only depends on the spatial coordinates. And we convert this to a Lagrangian by just replacing dt by t prime, in other words, dt d lambda. Uh, sorry. So we convert this to a Lagrangian. So I replace dt dt by t prime, so I have minus t prime squared, and then plus a squared of t, dij, okay, where, where I'm, I'm using a prime here to denote so prime on a quantity denotes that it's been differentiated with respect to lambda, the affine parameter, to distinguish that from a dot, which as we, as we said last time, I conventionally reserve for if a, if, a, if a quantity has a dot over it, that means that it's been differentiated with respect to cosmic time, t. Um, okay, so uh, let's derive the so you know we can we can drive four different Euler Lagrange equations for this because we have four coordinates. We can we can differentiate with respect to t or any of the spatial coordinates. But let's just we only need to differentiate with respect <coughs> to t for the following argument. So so the Euler Lagrange equation will be dl dt uh, is equal to partial l partial t prime prime. Okay, so the left-hand side, if the, the only t dependence in the metric, the only explicit dependence on t is here. So if we take dl dt, that's just a times a prime times this times this uh, times this spatial metric uh, times xi prime xj prime. But now here, xi prime and xj prime are nothing but pi and pj. That, so I'll just change notation to pi, pj. Um, and then let me, oh sorry, this should be a dot here because I'm taking uh, the derivative with respect to time, not, not with respect to lambda. Sorry about that. Um, and now let me, let me just pull an a squared out of here. Uh, so I'll write this as a dot over a. And then a squared gij okay but so now this guy is just this is the Hubble expansion rate we defined last time that's just H uh, this is just the three-dimensional part of the physical metric so this is the this is the co-moving part times a squared so that's just the that's the uh, and so if I take the, the three-dimensional components of the momentum and dot them together using the three-dimensional part of the metric, that is just the magnitude of the physical momentum squared. So I'll call that capital P squared. Okay, so, uh, so, so, that, that, so we've evaluated that side of the equation. This side of the equation is easier to evaluate. We just say dl dt prime uh, is minus t prime and then T prime is nothing but the zero component of the momentum, P zero. And so this, and so then we have to take that, prime that again. So that's nothing but uh, minus P zero prime. Okay, so let me just rewrite. So, so in other words, the Euler-Lagrange equation becomes minus P minus p0 prime is equal to h capital P squared, the, the magnitude of the three momentum squared. And now let's just use one more trick, which is that the, if the particle has mass m, the, the, the mass of the particle is equal to the square, the four dimensional dot product of the four momentum with itself, which in our case is just P0, minus p0 squared plus 
the, 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 the three metric dotted into the three-dimensional momentum, which is nothing what we, but what we previously defined as capital P squared. So this is minus P0 squared plus capital P squared. And now if we should just take D of both sides of this equation, well, the mass is a constant, so D of that is zero. And so this says that zero equals minus two P0 D P0 plus two capital P D capital P. Um, so let's use this to eliminate. Uh, okay, let's let, let's 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 take instead of just taking d, let's take d d lambda. So this is this is d p zero d lambda, or in other words, p zero prime, and this is d capital P d lambda, or in other words, capital P prime. So now if I just solve for this p p zero prime and eliminate it here. Uh, I get that this is minus uh, P, P prime over P zero. And now if I just notice that, so P prime is dP d lambda, P naught is by definition dT d lambda. So the d lambdas cancel. So this is this, these guys really combine to just give d capital B p dt. So this this is minus p d capital P dt is equal to this side, which is h is d a dt over a times p squared. Okay, so now I just see this is why normally I don't do the algebra on the board because I take forever to do it. So, so, but this this is so simple that I that I uh, well, but see now I've I've made it take forever. It's really supposed to be that there's a very simple argument here that uh, uh, anyway. Okay, it's too late to stop now. So let's cancel a factor of p squared from both sides. So that kills that guy, and that that kills the two. Um, multiply both sides, so uh, divide both sides by p uh, and multiply by dt. So, so in other words, this becomes dp over p is equal to minus dA over A. And so if we integrate that, that says log of p is equal to minus log of A plus a constant. Or in other words, p is proportional to 1 over A. Okay, so that's the thing we wanted to derive. That, uh, that the momentum, whether you're massless or massive, you're, you're, the magnitude of your three-dimensional physical momentum redshifts away as 1 over A. So as the universe expands and A increases, it sucks momentum away from you. So now what does that, what does that actually physically mean in, in the two cases of interest? One where you're a non-relativistic particle uh, moving through the universe like you or me or a galaxy, we're really very non-relativistic in the scheme of things. I mean, especially, you know, you guys. That means nothing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, okay, so if you, so in the non-relativistic case, the magnitude of your momentum is, is m times your speed v. And so, uh, your m is constant, so so if, if p is proportional to one over a, that's really saying that your velocity is proportional to one over a. So in other words, if we go back to our picture here, if you're at, if if you draw a dot on the balloon, and now you if you're just riding along at rest at, on one of those dots, your v is zero, and according to this equation. As the universe expands, v is proportional to 1 over a, it just stays 0. Okay, so if you're at rest at one of these dots, you remain at rest. A mass obser massive observer at rest remains at rest, and that, that's called, that, that observer is called a so-called so co-moving observer.
uh, and the coordinates, these, these, these spatial coordinates we're using, the ones that, that, that are drawn as dots on the balloon that are, that are just fixed on the spatial surface, which, which then expands, those are, called, those are correspondingly called co-moving coordinates. Okay, anyway, co-moving coordinates. Uh, and, you know, co-moving just means the coordinates are moving with the observer and the observer is moving with the coordinates. That's, that's what the co is. Um, okay, and this, this, this process is called, is called Hubble drag. Um, or you, you, you sometimes say that such an observer feels Hubble friction. You know, even if, they're, even if they're just moving through empty space, somehow their velocity is being sucked away by the expansion of the universe. So that, 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 that effect is, is called Hubble drag. And physically you can understand what's happening. That, that uh, you know, let's say, let's say at some moment in time you're moving with velocity v. So you're traveling toward this galaxy. But the universe is expanding. So this galaxy is, is moving away from you with some velocity. So when you, when you uh, once you get to this galaxy, your speed relative to it will be, you know, if it was very nearby, your speed relative to it will be the velocity that you had relative to this guy minus the recessional velocity of this guy. Your velocity will be a little bit less when you pass this guy. And so now you continue along to try to pass an, an, another galaxy. And uh, again, your, your velocity here is now reduced, but you're, you're trying to catch up with, with someone that's moving away from you. So once you get over to him, your velocity relative to him, rel relative to that co-moving galaxy or co-moving observer, will be slower still. So this is, you know, physically there's nothing mysterious about this effect. It's just that it's just that it's your velocity relative to co-moving observers that we're talking about here that falls to zero uh, as the universe expands. Um, yeah, maybe one other bit of terminology that's worth saying is that so when, when if, if you're not a co-moving observer and you instead have some, some velocity v relative to the, to the co-moving observer at the same point in space as you, that is called your quote-unquote peculiar velocity. Okay, and so for example, in our universe today, it so happens that most things have a peculiar velocity of roughly, you know, a couple hundred kilometers per second. So on average, they're, they're rather close. This is very non-relativistic velocity. So, so on average, they're rather close to being in the cosmic rest frame. They're rather close to being co-moving observers. But a random galaxy or a cluster of galaxies will not be strictly, will not be precisely at rest. It'll typically, ha typically have some little peculiar velocity, like our Milky Way galaxy, uh, of order a couple hundred kilometers per second. Okay, so that's massive particles. Um, now massless particles, so now their, their velocity doesn't get reduced as the universe expands because relative to any observer, as, as light passes them, they, they will see it moving at the speed of light. Um, but so now the, 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 for a massless particle, it's, or, or, or a, very, a particle that's so relativistic that it's, for all intents and purposes, massless, it's, 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 the magnitude of its momentum is equal to uh, its energy. And so that's the thing that gets redshifted away as, uh, as the universe expands. So, so, so according to, as measured by co-moving observers, as a photon goes, zooming across the universe and passes a bunch of co-moving observers along the way. Uh, so that th this guy will measure it to have some frequency. And then by the time it makes it over here, the universe has grown in size by a factor of two. And so the frequency, this, 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 this observer will say the frequency of the photon has been reduced by a factor of two. And if, if another factor of two growth has occurred by this time, the frequencies of the photon will be reduced by yet another factor of two. So in other words, the, the frequency is proportional to one over A as a particle propagates across the universe. Or in other words, its wavelength is, grows proportional to A. Okay, so in, in other words, that's an intuitive result. That as you, as you, as you have two observers uh, and they, 
the distance between the physical distance between them stretches by a factor of n that the corresponding length of a photon between them stretches by the same factor uh, in the same in the same time um, and uh, yeah so 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 again physically uh, oh, I should stop okay physically um, that uh, is just another way of saying what you know, it's just an equivalent way of saying what Hubble saw Hubble Hubble we said looked out uh, at distant galaxies and he saw that they were receding from him so how, how did he see that they were receding from him he measured that you know if let's say they let's say they emitted and, and, and they let's say there was a hydrogen cloud and it emitted and it was emitting uh, a couple of characteristic lines a couple of characteristic atomic transitions that hydrogen atoms emit then you know you, you know what wavelengths those things should be uh, in a lab on earth and he would observe the same pattern of lines but the whole thing was shifted to larger wavelengths and you know that 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 in the normal not good old non relativistic days that effect was already measured you you know if you just uh, if you if you took a ball of gas and and sent it traveling at some velocity away from you that you would see an ordinary doppler shift that would that would cause the pattern of lines to shift like that and so that that's how hubble interpreted it he just said oh that's that's just a doppler shift in there that's just saying that I'm seeing those lines Doppler shifted because those galaxies are receding from me. Um, and uh, so anyway, this is, just, this is just another equivalent way to say the same thing. In, 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 in GR, in the language of GR, it, it, it's true that the galaxies are receding from you. And the interpretation is that they're doing it because in the natural coordinates, the, the uh, spatial, the, the universe itself, the spatial slices of the universe are stretching with, with respect to time. And uh, and the wavelength is, is is stretching right alongside it. Um, okay, so that's that's uh, the 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 uh, the one other thing that I wanted to get to today that I'll do instead tomorrow is just um, the structure of horizons uh, in a in a uh, cosmological space time. You know, there, there's there there. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about it next time. Future horizons, past horizons, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, where you study uh, in scale or in? That's a good question. You know, I was kind of wondering, I've always wondered whether to include, there's a famous, yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, uh, so, if you have a collection of objects that are so, uh, that, that are sufficiently dense, uh, they their gra their gravitational attraction of one another gets so strong that the that the overall expansion of the the the, 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 gra the gravitational force if you want pulling them away due to the expansion of the universe uh, becomes is negligible in comparison so there's so so between the earth and the sun the gravitational force attractive force is just so gigantic relative to the effective gravitational force that 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 would be that would be pulling them away due to the hubble uh expansion that it's you could totally neglect it i mean it's it, it plays no role in the solar system uh there's a nice model called the spherical top hat model a spherically symmetric model that where you can see exactly quantitatively how that happens and uh you know so if you, basically, if you have a little, there's a, there's there's a nice model where you can work out everything analytically and and see that if you have a little, um, if the universe is completely uniform density everywhere, um, but at early times there was a little bump uh, at some some particular sphere in spherical region, there was a little bump where there was more density in there than everywhere else. That region has a little bit more gravity, has a little has, has a little bit stronger gravitational pull than everybody than, than everywhere else, and so uh, it tends to clump together. It tends to expand less rapidly clump and, uh, than the rest of than the rest of the universe, and so its over density relative to the rest of the universe grows and grows and grows, until eventually, uh, so 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 there's an instability. It's it it it, it starts off having just a little bit more gra more more self gravity than the rest of the universe. 
So it expands just a little bit more slowly, but because it expands more slowly, its density dilutes less quickly. And so at a later time, the, the density everywhere else has, has fallen a little bit, and it has fallen less quickly, let's say. So compared to the background, it's become an even bigger bump in density. And that goes on and on until it becomes such a big bump in local density over the, over the density everywhere else in space that its self-gravity gets so strong that it ceases to expand altogether and it just recollapses uh, down to a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies. Or, and so that, that's, that's, that's actually the physical picture of how the uh, actual structures in the universe, galaxies and clusters, formed is that they, originally the universe had completely uniform density to an accuracy of one part in 100,000, much more uniform than it is today. But then tiny little regions, some regions had slightly more density, some regions had slightly less density, and the regions that had slightly more density expanded slightly slower. So they, their density got more and more exaggerated relative to the cosmic mean. The regions that had slightly less density expanded slightly faster. Their, under, their, their, their emptiness got exaggerated relative to the cosmic mean. And that, that instability grew and grew and grew until today you have gigantic spikes in density, which we call galaxies. And, and, and everywhere else, there's, there's a nearly empty space. Um, is, that, uh, is that, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a confusing thing. And that, that's why this, this example where you can just do it ex explicitly is nice. But, um, I don't know whether we'll actually do that example in the class. Um, but I can show you where, yeah, I can show you where you can do it if you wanted to see it, understand that in more detail. So, um, any other questions? Yeah. So when we first started this whole analysis and we uh, wrote down those values, are we just interpreting the, we're just saying that there's an action <laughs> along the world line of the particle would be proportional to the proper line? Um, so that, yeah, that, that, that's a way to, de that's another way to derive the geodesic equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's very closely related to this, to this, to this way of getting the geodesic equation. Exactly. But that, but it's virtually equivalent. You know, this is, this is, the, 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 this is, it's, 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 it's very closely related. Uh, so, so. Uh, you, yeah, the, the, the Lagrangian for a point particle in general relativity is m d tau, and so you might you you might have said, oh, it looks it looks like uh, it looks like uh, l is let's say uh, uh, d tau d lambda or something like that, and you know you notice that that's not quite what we're doing. We're we're, we're we have we have we have a uh, uh, ds squared here, not ds. Uh, so there's so uh, so there's a there's a bit of there's a bit of there's you need to do a, a bit of thinking to convince yourself that this is the right answer, uh, 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 rather rather than this. But it, but in spirit, the idea is exactly that 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 uh, that. Uh, sorry, this this should. Uh, that you can think of this as being the geodesic equation derived from uh, this this Lagrangian. So you would define that first two Lagrangians give the same equation to make um, uh, Well, yeah. So so any way you vary this action, if you do it correctly, exactly. That 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 that, that certainly should be true. Yes. So 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 re so re really, it's really it's kind of a matter of convenience that to not. Have to deal with a square root action. You, you you manipulate things until you can see that you see that you are that you can use ds squared itself as the Lagrangian. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Great. So see you on Friday.